Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton, and in this video we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. In the last section, we talked about how to find the area under a curve that's bounded by the x-axis between an x equals a and an x equals b on a closed interval. We found out that we can find the area under the curve if it's a nice geometric figure, or we approximated the area using approximation rectangles as part of a Riemann sum. And we know that if the number of rectangles increase to infinity, then we find out the actual area under the curve. This section will contain the most important and the most used theorem in all of calculus, and it's called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. It was discovered independently by Isaac Newton and Wilfred Leibniz in the late 1600s. It establishes the connection between derivatives and integrals, and it provides a way to easily calculate the definite integral. And it's a key step in the development of modern mathematics that supports the rise of science and technology. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to use the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus to determine the value of definite integrals. A fundamental theorem of calculus, the definite integral of a function y equals f of x on a closed interval is a number that represents the area of the region between the graph of y equals f of x bounded by the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b. On the other hand, the indefinite integral of a function is a family of antiderivatives. The fundamental theorem actually provides a connection between these two different types of integrals. So the fundamental theorem of calculus. If capital F of x is the family of antiderivatives for this function f of x, so it's the indefinite integral of f of x dx is capital F of x, and lowercase f of x is continuous on a closed interval a to b, then the definite integral of f of x from x equals a to x equals b is denoted this way, as we talked about in the previous video. It's the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b. a is the lower limit of integration, and b is the upper limit of integration. f of x is the integrand, and x is the variable of integration. You can calculate this area or this value of the definite integral by finding an antiderivative for this function f of x. So it's capital F, and you evaluate it at the upper limit of integration. Subtract the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration, x equals a. In other words, you need to evaluate the antiderivative at the upper limit of integration and then subtract the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration. Why the fundamental theorem of calculus is so important is because it gives us a way to actually calculate the area under a curve that's bounded by the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b by just finding a family of antiderivatives for the integrand. So there are a couple steps. Number one, you find an antiderivative, capital F of x, of the integrand, lowercase f of x, in the integral. And then number two, you simply evaluate the antiderivative at x equals b, the upper limit of integration, and then you subtract the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration. And it has to be in this order because we're using subtraction. So it's the upper limit of integration goes into the antiderivative first, and then you subtract the antiderivative with the lower limit of integration going in second. Note, in other words, notice that we use the word an antiderivative. It does not matter what antiderivative you find to actually use for the fundamental theorem of calculus. You can use any antiderivative. We can choose the simplest antiderivative where c equals zero, since any value of c can just drop out when we actually compute the difference between the antiderivatives, capital F of b minus F of a because f of b would give you a plus c, but then you're subtracting f of a, which would also have a plus c, so, and so that you would have c subtract c, and so you just get zero anyways. So we can just use the antiderivative where c equals zero when we do our calculations. In the following example, we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate definite integrals, rather than using the Riemann sum representing areas of approximation rectangles. The evaluation f of b subtract f of a can be represented using this notation. It's the family of antiderivatives, or just an antiderivative, capital F of x, evaluated, so the vertical bar just means evaluate. The upper limit of integration was x equals b. The lower limit of integration is x equals a. Or if the variable x is just understood, then you can just leave off the x equals b and x equals a and just write capital F of x, vertical bar for evaluate, b, and then a. b is the upper limit of integration, and a is the lower limit of integration. So example one, evaluating definite integrals. Evaluate the following definite integrals. We're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus for each of these problems. Number one, find the value of the definite integral from x equals two to x equals four of the function three x squared dx. So there is a couple steps with the fundamental theorem of calculus. We know that we need to find an antiderivative. We'll just use where the antiderivative is c equals zero. So let's find out what is the antiderivative of three x squared. What was the function before you took the derivative to get three x squared? So we know that three is a coefficient. We want to keep it. And now, since x squared is the power function, we can use the power rule for antiderivatives. So we want to add 1 to the exponent. So it was x squared, so you want to add 1 to the exponent to make it x cubed. But then you need to divide by the new exponent, so it becomes x cubed divided by 3. And then evaluate, because we found an antiderivative for this function, 3x squared. And you want to evaluate when the upper limit of integration was 4, so x equals 4. And evaluate when the lower limit of integration was 2, or x equals 2. 
And so notice that you can simplify the antiderivative. The threes will cancel out because you have three divided by three. And so that you just have x cubed evaluated at x equals four and then x equals two. So remember that you need to plug in the upper limit of integration first and then get that answer, then subtract when you plug in the lower limit of integration into the antiderivative. So you have x cubed evaluated at four first, so four cubed, subtract. When you plug in the lower limit of integration, you'll get two cubed. So four cubed, subtract two cubed, that's 64 subtract eight or 56. That means that the area under the curve, three x squared from x equals two to x equals four and above the x-axis is 56. Number two, find out the value of this definite integral from negative one to one of the function seven x subtract two x squared and the variable of integration is x. So just like we had properties for the indefinite integral where we can find the family of integers of each term separately, we can also have properties for the definite integral. So we can find out the indefinite integral of each term separately and keep the signs between the terms. So we have the indefinite integral from negative one to one of the first term was seven x dx. Subtract, keep the sign between the two different integrals. The integral from negative one to one of two x squared dx. So notice that you keep the limits of integration the same. It was from negative one to one, and each integral is also from negative one to one when you break it up into two different integrals. So now let's find out the antiderivative of each term separately. So seven is a coefficient, well, let's keep it. And then x is a power function, so we can use a power rule for integration. And so we wanna add one to the exponent to make it x squared, but then also divide by the new exponent. So you have seven times x squared divided by two, evaluated because we now have the antiderivative. You want to evaluate when the upper limit of integration is one, and the lower limit of integration is negative one. Subtract, and then two is a coefficient for the second integral, so you want to keep it, and then find the family of integrals for x squared, well that will be x cubed divided by three using the power rule again, and then evaluate again when the upper limit of integration is x equals one, and the lower limit of integration is x equals negative one. So we need to use the fundamental theorem of calculus a couple times. Let's use the fundamental theorem of calculus one time for the first integral, and then also for the second integral. So we have seven halves, that's the coefficient. We have x squared is the antiderivative. And now plug in x equals one for the upper limit of integration, and then subtract your answer when you plug in x equals negative one into the antiderivative. So one plugged in for x, you'll get one squared. Subtract, that's the subtraction for the fundamental theorem of calculus. Then plug in negative one, you'll get negative one squared in parentheses. Then subtract between the two different integrals. You have the coefficient two thirds. And then again, use the fundamental theorem of calculus to plug in x equals one into the antiderivative, you'll get one cubed. Subtract, when you plug in the lower limit of integration in parentheses, you'll get negative one in parentheses cubed. So now it's just a matter of simplifying. Inside the parentheses, you have one squared, subtract negative one in parentheses squared. So one squared is one, and negative one in parentheses squared is one. So you'll have seven halves times in parentheses one minus one. Subtract two thirds times one cubed. One cubed is one, and then negative one in parentheses cubed is negative one. So you have one subtract negative one. So negative two thirds times the quantity, one subtract negative one in parentheses. And so the first parentheses is seven halves times zero minus two thirds times two after you have one subtract negative one gives you two. And so if you simplify, you'll get negative four thirds. So the area under the curve, y equals seven x subtract two x squared from x equals negative one to x equals one that's bounded by the x-axis is negative four thirds. So since the answer is negative, that means that there's more area under the x-axis than there was above the x-axis. Number three, let's find out the area from x equals one to x equals two of this function, y equals x squared subtract three with respect to x. So again, you have two different terms, let's separate them out into two different integrals. So you have the limits of integration from x equals one to x equals two, keep those with both integrals when you separate them out. So you have the definite integral from x equals one to x equals two of the first term, x squared dx, subtracts, keep the sign between the two different integrals, and then definite integral x equals one to x equals two of the second term, which was three dx. Now find the antiderivative of each term separately. So you have x squared, that's a power function. We found its antiderivative before, it's x cubed divided by three. So x cubed divided by three evaluated when x equals two and x equals one, the limits of integration. Subtract the antiderivative of three with respect to x is three x. And again, evaluate when x equals two and x equals one, the limits of integration. So using the fundamental theorem of calculus, you use the upper limit of integration into the antiderivative first. So you have two cubed divided by three, then subtract when you plug in the lower limit of integration. So you have one cubed divided by three, and then subtract. Now plug in the upper limit of integration for this other antiderivative. You have three times x is the antiderivative, so three times two. Subtract three times one for the lower limit of integration. And now it's just a matter of simplifying. Two cubed divided by three gives you eight thirds. One cubed divided by three is one third. And so inside the first parentheses, you have seven thirds. Now in the second set of parentheses, you have three times two, that's six. Three times one, that's three. And so the second set of parentheses will just give you three. So seven thirds subtract three will give you negative two thirds.
So the area under the curve y equals x squared subtract 3 from x equals 1 to x equals 2 is negative 2 thirds. Number 4, you have the definite integral from x equals 1 to x equals 4 of the quantity 3 halves times the square root of x subtract 4 divided by x squared dx. So we've seen something similar to this back in the first section of this chapter. We have two different terms, but we have the square root of x. We know that we need to change that to a fractional power. And we also have x squared in the denominator of the second term. We know that we need to rewrite this as x to the negative 2 power, bringing the x squared back up to the numerator. But let's first separate this out into two separate integrals. We have the integral from 1 to 4 of the first term, 3 halves times square root of x dx. Subtract the definite integral from 1 to 4 of 4 divided by x squared dx. And so now let's change the square root of x to x to the 1 half power. So you have the definite integral from 1 to 4 of 3 halves x to the 1 half power dx. And then it's the same thing with the second term. You want to change the x squared in the denominator to make it to the numerator with x to the negative 2 power. So subtract the integral from 1 to 4, 4 times x to the negative 2 power dx. So remember from the previous video, there's a constant multiple rule that says that we can take constants outside the integral sign. So the 3 halves can be taken outside the first integral, and 4 can be taken outside the second integral, and we can focus on just the antiderivative of x to the 1 half and the antiderivative of x to the negative 2 separately. So 3 halves times the integral from 1 to 4, x to the half dx, subtract 4 times the integral from 1 to 4 of x to the negative 2 dx. So we have 3 halves times, now let's find out what the integral of x to the half is. x to the half is a power function, so again, add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. So you have 3 halves times, well the new exponent becomes 3 halves because 1 half plus 1 gives you 3 halves. But then you have to divide by 3 halves, which is really multiplication by 2 thirds. So you have 3 halves, that's the coefficient, times 2 thirds times x to 3 halves, evaluate now because we have found the antiderivative, evaluate at x equals 4 and x equals 1, the limits of integration. Then subtract the second integral, we want to find out the antiderivative of x to negative 2, so keep 4 as a coefficient, so x to negative 2 is a power function, so add 1 to the exponent and also divide by the new exponent, so you get x to negative 1 divided by negative 1, and now evaluate at x equals 4 and x equals 1, the limits of integration. So notice that we can simplify the antiderivative before we can plug in the limits of integration. So 3 halves times 2 thirds, that's just 1. So you have x to 3 halves, evaluate at x equals 4 and x equals 1. And then you have negative 4 divided by negative 1, that's positive 4. x to negative 1, evaluate it at the limits of integration, x equals 4 and x equals 1. So now let's use the fundamental theorem of calculus. You plug in the upper limit of integration first, and then you subtract your answer when you plug in the lower limit of integration. So plug in 4 first, you get 4 to the 3 halves. Subtract, when you plug in 1 into the empty derivative, you'll get 1 to the 3 halves. So you get this answer is 4 to the 3 halves, subtract 1 to the 3 halves, plus, then you plug in x equals 4 into the other antiderivative, you'll get 4 times 4 to the negative 1 power. Subtract, when you plug in the lower limit of integration, you'll have 4 times 1 to the negative 1 power. And so now just simplify. So 4 to the 3 halves will just be 8, and 1 to the 3 halves power will just be 1. So you have 8 subtract 1 from that parentheses. And now the second set of parentheses, you have 4 times 4 to the negative 1 power, that'll just give you 1, and then subtract. 4 times 1 to the negative 1, that's just negative 4, so 1 minus 4. And so now you have 8 minus 1, that's 7, and then the second set of parentheses is negative 3, so 7 subtract 3 will give you 4. And so the area under the curve, y equals 3 halves times the square root of x, subtract 4 divided by x squared, from x equals 1 to x equals 4, bounded by the x-axis, is positive 4. That's the area. Now let's try one more, number 5. Let's find out the area or the value of this definite integral from x equals 0 to x equals natural log of 2 of 3 times e to the x dx. 3 is just a coefficient, so we can take 3 outside the definite integral using the constant multiple property. So let's take 3 on the outside to 3 times the integral from 0 to natural log of 2 of e to the x dx. And now find the antiderivative of e to the x, which is also e to the x. So you have 3 times e to the x. Now evaluate at the upper limit of integration, which is x equals natural log of 2, and then subtract when you plug in the lower limit of integration into the antiderivative, which is x equals 0. So you have 3 times e, and x is the in the exponent, so you have natural log of 2 in the exponent, so 3 times e, natural log of 2, subtract 3 times e to the lower limit of integration, so 3 times e to the 0, and so 3 times e to the natural log of 2, the e and the natural log of 2 would just cancel each other out because they're inverses, and you have 3 times 2 left over, and then e to the 0 power is just 1, so you have 3 times 1. So 3 times 2, subtract 3 times 1, will give you 6 minus 3, or 3. So the area under the curve, y equals 3 times e to the x, from x equals 0 to x equals natural log of 2, bounded by the x-axis, is positive 3. We can also use the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate definite integrals from application problems where the graph of the function was previously needed. So example 2, distance traveled. The velocity of an object, t seconds after its launch, is given by the function, Velocity function v of t is 5t cubed, subtract 2t plus 10 feet per second. Number one, 
how far will the object travel during its first four seconds of movement? So we know that if we want to calculate the distance, that we want to find out the antiderivative of this function v of t because that will give us the position function. The distance traveled during the first four seconds would be the definite integral from t equals zero to t equals four of the function v of t, where the variable is t. So let's replace v of t with a function that was given in the problem. So it's the definite integral from zero to four of five t cubed subtract two t plus 10 dt. And so now we need to find out what is the value of this definite integral. So let's use the sum and difference properties to separate this out into three different integrals for each of the three terms. So we have the definite integral from zero to four of five t cubed, that's the first term, dt. Subtract the definite integral from zero to four of the second term, two t, and then dt. And then plus the definite integral from zero to four of the last term, which is 10 dt. Now find the antiderivative of each term separately, and then use the fundamental theorem of calculus to plug in the upper limit of integration, t equals four, and the lower limit of integration, t equals zero. So if five is a coefficient, we want to keep it. t cubed is a power function where the t is the variable of integration. So let's add one to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. So you'll get t to the fourth divided by four. So five times t to the fourth divided by four. Evaluate it because we now have the integral. Evaluate when t equals four as the upper limit and t equals zero as the lower limit. Then subtract what's the integral of two t. Two is a coefficient, so keep it. The integral of t is t squared divided by two. And then evaluate at t equals four and t equals zero again. And then plus, the antiderivative of 10 is 10 times t because the variable integration is t and evaluate again at t equals 4 and t equals 0. And now we're ready to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. You plug in the upper limit of integration first, get that answer, and then plug in the lower limit of integration into the antiderivative. So you have 5 fourths times, plug in 4 into the antiderivative, you'll get 4 to the fourth power, subtract, plug in the lower limit of integration, you'll get 0 to the fourth. So 5 fourths times the quantity, 4 to the fourth, subtract 0 to the fourth. Then keep the sign between the two different integrals. Notice that the twos will cancel out. You have two divided by two. So you just have left is t squared. Evaluate at t equals four and t equals zero. You have four squared first, then it's subtract zero squared. And then the last term, you have 10 times t. Again, plug in the upper limit of integration first. So you have 10 times four, then plug in the lower limit of integration. You have 10 times zero, so 10 times four, subtract 10 times zero. So now just simplify. You have five fourths, four to the fourth is 256. Zero to the fourth is zero, so it just goes away. Subtract, four squared subtract zero squared will give you 16, and then 10 times four subtract 10 times zero will just give you 40. So five fourths times 256 subtract 16 plus 40, if you evaluate this, you'll get 344. So that means the distance traveled by the object during the first four seconds would be 344 feet. Number two, how far will the object travel during the next four seconds of movement? So if we're talking about the next four seconds, then we're talking about starting at t equals four and going up to t equals eight seconds. So the distance traveled during the next four seconds will be the definite integral from four to eight via t dt. So it's gonna be exactly the same work as we had in the previous part, except we're evaluating it at t equals four and t equals eight. Eight's the upper limit of integration and t equals four is the lower limit of integration. So we have the same function, v t cubed, subtract two t plus 10 for the velocity function, separated out into three different integrals, all starting from t equals four and ending at t equals eight. Find the antiderivative of each term separately, same way as we did in the last part. So we have five times t to the fourth divided by four using the power function. To find the antiderivative of t cubed, evaluate at t equals eight and t equals four. Then subtract, the antiderivative of the second term was two times t squared divided by two. And again, evaluate at t equals eight and t equals four. Plus the last term, the integral was 10 times t. And again, evaluate at t equals eight and t equals four. So now use the fundamental theorem of calculus to plug in the upper limit of integration into the antiderivative, find that answer, and then subtract when you plug in the lower limit of integration to the antiderivative. So the first integral was 5 fourths t to the fourth. Let's plug in 8 first because that's the upper limit of integration. So you, so you have 5 fourths times 8 to the fourth power. Subtract when you plug in the lower limit of integration, you have 4 to the fourth power. The second integral, we've solved this before. The twos will cancel out and you'll just be left with t squared. So again, you'll have 8 squared. Subtract 4 squared for the second integral. And the third integral, the integral was 10 times t. So plug in 8 first, you get 10 times 8. Then subtract, when you plug in four, you get 10 times four. So now just evaluate this. You have five fourths times eight to the fourth minus four to the fourth, that's 3,840. Subtract, eight squared subtract four squared, that will give you 64 subtract 16, so subtract 64 subtract 16, plus 10 times eight is 80, subtract 10 times four is 40, so, so the last parentheses is 80 minus 40. So evaluate this, you'll get 4,792 feet. So the object has traveled 4,792 feet between four seconds and eight seconds. Example three, population growth of bacteria. Suppose that t minutes after putting 1,000 bacteria on a petri plate, the rate of growth of the population is capital B prime of t is six times t bacteria per minute. Number one, 
how many new bacteria are added to the population during the first seven minutes. So we know that the number of bacteria is the area under the curve representing the rate of growth because we're given the derivative capital B prime of T. If we find the family of integers for this function capital B prime of T, then we'll have the function capital B of T, which is representing the population of the bacteria on the Petri plate. So capital B of T is the family of integers of capital B prime of T, dt. So replace capital B prime of T with 6 times T. And so now we want to find the family of integers of 6T. 6 is a coefficient, so you want to keep it. T is a power function, so add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent to find its family of integers. And so you have 6 times T squared divided by 2. And then plus C because we want to find the family of integers. So now simplify, you get 3T squared plus C, where C is the constant of integration. So during the first 7 minutes, what is the population growth? We know that's the definite integral from 0 to 7 of the same function 6t for the capital B prime of t. We know that the integral of that is 3t squared, and now we want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate this at t equals 7, the upper limit, and t equals 0, the lower limit of integration. So plug in 7 first, you get 3 times 7 squared. Then subtract, when you plug in 0 for t, you have 3 times 0 squared. And so 3 times 7 squared, subtract 3 times 0 squared, will give you 147. So the population of bacteria on the Petri plate increased by 147 between 0 and 7 minutes. Number 2. What is the total population on the Petri plate after 7 minutes? Notice in the problem that we were told that the initial population was 1,000 bacteria on the Petri plate. We know that during the first 7 minutes, we found out the population increased by 147 bacteria. So now it's 1,000 plus 147 bacteria or 1,147 bacteria on the Petri plate after 7 minutes. So let's do one more example. Example 4, change in the profit. Suppose that a company manufactures and sells Toshiba smart TVs. The company's monthly marginal profit in dollars is given by capital P prime of X is 165 subtract 0.1 X, where X is between 0 and 4,000. So X is representing the number of Toshiba smart TVs manufactured in a month. The company is currently manufacturing 1,500 smart TVs per month, but is planning to increase production. Find the change in the monthly profit if the monthly production increased to 1,600 Toshiba smart TVs. So the function that's given in the problem is the marginal profit. Capital P prime of X is 165 subtract 0.1X. The problem is asking about how much is the profit changed, not the marginal profit. So we want to find out what is capital P of X. Capital P of X is the family of antiderivatives of the marginal profit function, capital P prime of X. So we replace capital P prime of X in the indefinite integral with 165 subtract 0.1X. And now find the family of integers of each term separately. So the family of integers of 165 dx subtract the family of integers of 0.1x dx. So if x is the variable of integration, the integer of 165 is 165 times x. And then keep the negative sign between the two different integrals. The integer of 0.1x, 0.1 is the coefficient, so you want to keep it. And x is the power function, so add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. So you'll get 0.1 times x squared divided by 2. And since we're talking about a family of integers, we need the plus C for the constant of integration. So now just simplify. You have 165x, subtract 0.1 divided by 2 is negative 0.05, and you keep the x squared, and then plus C. So what all this means is that the change in the monthly profit will be when they change the production from 1,500 TVs to 1,600 TVs. That gives us the limits of integration on the definite integral. So the definite integral from 1,500 to 1,600, P prime of x dx, will give, will give us the change in the profit for that month which is the definite integral from 1500 to 1600 of the marginal profit function. We know that the antiderivative needs to be found because we want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the antiderivative was 165x, subtract 0.05x squared, and we can just make c equal 0 for the antiderivative. And now evaluate this at the upper limit of integration, x equals 1600, and then evaluate at the lower limit of integration, x equals 1500. So when you plug in x equals 1600 in for the antiderivative, you'll get 165 times 1600 for the x, Subtract 0.05 times x squared, that's 1600 squared now. Get that entire answer, and then subtract when you plug in 1500 and for the x values. So you have 165 times 1500 for the x again, so minus 0.05 times x squared, that's negative 0.05 times 1500 squared. Get this answer, and then you want to subtract the two different answers that you get from the limits of integration. So the first set of parentheses will give you $136,000. The second set of parentheses will give you $135,000. And so there's a difference of $1,000 in the change in the profit. And so that means that the profit changed by $1,000 for that month. If the production changed from 1,500 TVs to 1,600 TVs, the company will have a profit change of $1,000. So this is a good place to stop our video. Now that we talked about how to use the fundamental theorem of calculus by finding an antiderivative and then evaluating at the upper limit of integration and evaluating at the lower limit of integration, 
If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about how to use the substitution method with definite integrals and the fundamental number of calculus.